Uh, my name is Ndwati, Ndwati Morige, should have probably started there. Uh, I serve as within the pastoral team. I'm one of the pastors here at Nairobi Chapel, Lovington, and it's such a pleasure to have this opportunity once again to bring the Word of God to us. Um, needless to say, something else that I also do is music, spoken word, rap, something that I really enjoy. Um, so yeah, so we are continuing with uh, our sermon series. It's called A Wild Wild in Invitation. We are thinking about Christmas, and what we want to communicate is that Jesus coming is an invitation to all people everywhere. And when we say all people everywhere, we mean exactly that, like it's all people. And sometimes maybe because of the culture we've grown up in, because of how we talk um, amongst ourselves, sometimes one thing may be said, but you don't think that it means exactly that. And so, for example, let's say you, you're visiting someone. So they'll definitely welcome you. Karibu um, sana. Feel at home. I'm glad you're here. Just feel at home. Um, but if you were to take that literally and probably decide to go to the kitchen and fix yourself a sandwich, or you decide, ah, nimechoka, let me go take a nap, and you go to their bed, and that's what feeling at home means, but mtakosana at that point. Or you continue on and you have a good time, tell stories, have a meal, you're about to leave and they're happy you are there and they say, it was so good to have you. Like, just come by anytime. Just come anytime. But if you started knocking at their place at probably Tuesday, 2 a.m., or just come up at any given point, it may raise questions. They might get angry with you. And so we probably live in a time or in a culture where we say one thing and we instead understand something else. We understand you're being polite, you're um, overstating, so to speak, but we get what you're saying. And so sometimes we hear some things from the Bible, we hear some things being communicated, and we don't really fully grasp how far that goes. And so when the Bible is telling us that Jesus has come during this season of Christmas, and he has come for all people everywhere, it's all people everywhere, all types of people. No one will be left out from this party. And so we, our reading today will be coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. So if you have your Bibles, which I really pray you do, you could open the book of Matthew, chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. So we'll read it. Yeah, just a heads up. Um, somewhere, I can't find my sermon notes. So pray with me as we deliver this sermon. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 to 13. It's going to be fine. Chap uh, verse 1 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all him. When he, called, when he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem, in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I may go and worship him. After they had had the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, 
they returned to their country by another route. Let's pray for God's word. Our Father in heaven, we truly, really are grateful that we have again one more opportunity to gather together as a community of believers. We gather together knowing that we need you um, to shape our lives, to shape our thoughts, to shape our actions. And you do this through your word. And so today as we receive from your word, oh Lord, we pray that it may find fertile ground, that our hearts would be ready to receive what you wish to communicate to us this morning. And oh Lord, I even do pray for myself, oh Lord, that you would use me in this specific time to pass your message to your people. We trust you, we love you. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the story we have today is a very, I'd say, familiar story. Um, if any story probably makes to be a common theme in Christmas carols, that's probably a very common story. Because even Christmas per se is not just celebrated by Christians. People all over sing songs about Christmas. But even in our Christian community, this is a very familiar story. And we know the story of these three kings. Um, we've just learned probably they weren't. But we know them as such, that they came from a far land bearing gifts, and they worshipped this little child. And sometimes we never pause to think about who these people were. And so that's what we're going to do today, just trying to understand who they are and what their significance is. But before even we do that, we'll go to last week's message and just uh, break it down, Kidogo, or probably highlight something that we didn't talk about. And so when we were talking about last week, we went through a genealogy, and we had a number of names, and we talked about it. Um, but something that we missed out is that there was something peculiar, interesting, different about that genealogy. And something that was going, uh, going on is that there were women in that genealogy. So if you read all the genealogies that you'll come across in Genesis, Chronicles, Numbers, wherever, even Luke has one. But all of them, it's just like, it's a male-dominated field. It's just one man who gave, uh, who was a father to another man, who was a father to another man, and so on and so forth. And so when Matthew decides to put in women into the story, that's something very countercultural for his time. That his contemporaries are looking at him, his fellow authors, and they're wondering, what have you just done? And... The society then, probably we are more advanced Kidogo, but the society then, um, which is probably like most societies, was very patriarchal. And so even, um, I remember in Form 1, we had a saying that Form 1s are to be seen but not to be heard. Like you're just there, but you have no input, your stories are not told, you basically kind of not, don't matter. And I'd say that would be a close equivalent of what these women were. That women in those societies, they, are, they weren't part of the story. Their stories were not to be told. Um, but Matthew does this, and this is a first layer that we see that they are being included into the story. That as a story is being told of the family of God and how we can get into it, we find women being placed there. And so in a society where they wouldn't be placed, they have been placed. Matthew is doing something that's very deliberate. But there's probably another layer to it. And probably we've heard this about in different sermons. And it's a talk about how when you look now into their stories, these different women, you realize that there's probably a common theme or a common thread. So there are five women, including Mary, um, so I'd like to even hear from the crowd, crowd if we know the other four. Um, just uh, raise your hands. I have a gift for the people who like know them. So just say, uh -huh. we have Tama. That's correct. Uh -huh. Another one. We have Ruth. Wonderful. I saw something there. Tama, Ruth. Rehab, Rehab. Wonderful. Uh, uh, the last one? This is the last one. So we have Tema, Rahab, Ruth. The last one. Connect. Uh -huh. 
Beth. No, apart from Mary, there's another one. It was associated with David. But she, but wonderful. Um, I've promised gifts. Ashers, if you can collect the names, I'll pray for those people. Uh, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for you guys this week. You'll have a phenomenal week. Uh, so we have Rahab, Ruth, Tema, um, and Bathsheba. And probably we are familiar with their stories. Probably not. I'll just give a quick overview for the sake of the people who are not familiar with them. The first one who's on the list is Tema. So Judah, who is one of the sons of Jacob, moves to another land, finds a wife, gets three sons and then decides to find a wife for the firstborn son. And then for some reason, the firstborn son dies without getting a kid. And so um, the second, according to their customs, it would be that the next brother in line would take that person as a wife so that the name of the firstborn can continue. So as it okay, uh, Tupu. So the second born goes in, but the second born does something very evil, and so he's also struck down by God. And so now Judah had three sons. Two have died, allegedly because of Tamar, or maybe that's what he's thinking. And so for this third one, this is what he says. He says, Tamar, um, my third-born son um, is very young, so what you can do, just go back home, chill for a few years. When he's of age, I will call you. Judah wasn't planning to call him to call her, sorry. And so Tama, years go by, she realizes I was actually lied to. I wasn't going to be called. And so she can't be married to anyone else. She's left there. Um, she has no one to take care of, of her because um, she was already married off and she belongs to another family. But the family that she belongs to doesn't want um, her. And so what Tama does at some point, he realizes Judah is coming um, into the town where Tama lives, and so she disguises herself as a prostitute. And what she wants to do is she wants to trap Judah. Um, and it apparently works, and that's the story of the first person, Tama. The story of the second person in the story is Rahab. Um, we don't know much about, it, about her. We just know that she's in the book of Joshua, and when she comes onto the scene, she's hiding some spies who have come. And from, that, from there on, we always know her occupation. We are told that there's two spies who are hiding in the house of Rahab the harlot, or the prostitute. Um, it's so interesting that even when we go all the way to Hebrews, um, in chapter 11, in the Hall of Fame, he finally, she, she makes it to that list, but somehow this name still sticks. And so I think everyone, the entire Christian community, knew her as Rahab the prostitute. The next story is about Ruth. Ruth who um, goes with Naomi back into um, Naomi's home. Um, not much can be said of her. Um, some people are skeptical. Some people wonder when Naomi tells Ruth to go and late in the night um, freshen up. Jipake marash kidogo alafu. Go by his feet and uncover his feet. Some people think it was just uncovering his feet. Some people think it was more than just uncovering his feet, which is neither here nor there. I am of the opinion that it's the former, that it was just uncovering his feet. But there's questions to be raised on why she goes in the middle of the night. And the last story is Bathsheba. It's probably the most common of them all, that Bathsheba was bathing. David saw um, her by the rooftop and called her. And I doubt Bathsheba could say no. And so we have this string of um, impurity in terms of sexuality. And so you would think, if we really wanted to include women, Matthew, you could have included some other women. We have other women who, like, their story is not too bad. We have Rebecca. Not, it's not as shady. You could have included Sarah, for sure. Sarah is our matriarch. You'd have included Leah and Rachel. They don't have such difficult stories to wrap our heads around. Why would you include these people? And so first, layer number one is that we have women in that list. Layer number two is that we have um, 
Um, not the best of stories, let me just put it that way. But there's also another layer that probably we miss out. Um, and so they were also Gentiles. And what that means is that they were non-Jews. So Abraham was a Jew, his whole family line is Jew. But all these people are outsiders who are being joined into the family of God. And so Ruth was a Moabite. Naomi had gone to Moab to seek for food. Tema, Judah had moved away from his family home and had gone to the people of Canaan. Rahab was definitely to remember us needed to write something. That whenever Uriah is described, he's described as Uriah the Hittite. And so Bathsheba, by being married to her, she had already, if she was Jewish, she had forsaken her Jewish heritage and decided to be a people of the Hittite. And so all these people are genuine outsiders to the story. And so we're being told the story of how the king of the Jews is coming, but how even the king of the Jew, Jews comes is through people who are not Jewish. And so just notice all those layers that are going on. There's about them being women. There's about them being sexually um, impure. And then there's also the fact that they are Gentiles. They are legitimate outsiders. But Matthew is telling us that they are bona fide, bona fide people um, in the family of God. And so then we get to Matthew chapter 2. We are, we are being told about the Magi. Um, and so in our, how we know them, most of us, probably is the wise men. Um, some translation, actually most translation, mm -hmm. translate that verse and put wise men. And so we've always known them as wise men. And when you hear wise men, you never raises questions. It's just like, oh, wise men, oh, cool. They were learned, they were brilliant guys. And so it's always positive connotation. And then somehow through Christian tradition, it so happened that they were labeled as kings, we three kings. Um, and also when you hear kings, you also don't have too many questions. You're like, oh, they're kings, mm, good. And so we easily move along with the story whenever we read it. But I think Matthew wanted us to pause at that point, and we're going to pause for a minute and try to discover who this Magi were from the East. And so some translations, like the one I'm using in IV, just retains the word Magi. Um, and so Magi is not really a translation, it's a transliteration. And what that means is you just flip the letters into the language you want to turn it to. And we do that at times. So for example, what's um, bicycle in Kiswahili? Bicycle, brilliant, brilliant. Um, what's uh, music in Kiswahili? Mziki, wonderful. I don't have gifts, guys. But <laughs> you're answering with such, Nini, I'm excited. So we have such categories in our own language. Um, even for some of our words, I remember computer was computer. Then it became tarakilishi. Television was televisheni and then it became Runinga. And so the word Maja is actually Greek for Magos. Um, and it appears five times in the New Testament. So three times in this story, we're going to look at the other two times where it appears. And it appears in the book of Acts, chapter 13. And so if you could turn with me, let's discover who these guys are. So Acts, chapter 13, verse 6 to 8. chapter 13, verse 6 to 8. This is what it says. They traveled through... So there is Paul. So backstory, um, just at the beginning of this chapter, Paul and Barnabas are being set apart for worldwide missions. So the church of Antioch, five elders are praying. They hear the Holy Spirit saying, set apart Paul and Barnabas for missions. And here they start. So they traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer, 
and a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Pallas. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. So verse 6 and verse 8, wherever you are seeing the word sorcerer, probably a translation has magician, which would make sense. That's the word magi. And so you realize that there's probably more to these people who are coming to see Jesus, that they were probably, not they were probably, they were not as dignified as we'd want to think of them, at least in our eyes, because whenever we read this passage, we think wise men, kings, and we realize that there's something going on, that they were sorcerers, that they were magicians. If you look at other translation, it talks of them as them being wise men and priests who are also astrologers. If they are priests and they are coming from another country, they are definitely priests who are given to other gods. And so for us, when we read this passage, we don't think about it much because of probably um, what we already think about it. But for the original readers, when they were reading this passage, they really have question marks. And they're asking Matthew, of all the people who could come to visit Jesus, of all the stories you could highlight about his infancy, why do you have these people? And it's probably a whole group, a huge group. Probably the best um, connection we can find is like when you read in the book of Daniel, whenever Nebuchadnezzar has dreams, and then they're, they're, they, he, he really, really wants an interpretation because probably the dream is disturbing or hard to interpret. And then if you read those lists, he calls out, so many people, and we are told they are astrologers and wise men and sorcerers and um, all that. That whole list, um, that whole list, that's a magi. And so it's this huge group of people. When they are walking into Jerusalem, asking around who is the king of the Jews, I bet the people are wondering, who are these people? What are you coming to do here? And so they are definitely Gentiles. They are def they are they are most likely, not most likely, they are given to other gods. They practice some sort of spirituality that is not accepted by the God of Yahweh. But they are the people that Matthew is highlighting in this story. And the reason why this is significant is this, that Matthew is highlighting the outcasts the misfits, the people who everyone would cringe at when they would read this story, most especially the Gentiles. It's because he is, w I think he is winning the readers into getting something. So for example, I actually don't know if this is how it works, but I assume if a child doesn't like malenge, um, you mix it with something he likes, and then you put it in the mouth, and then eventually, because you know he needs the malenge, um, he'll, he'll be taking it in, maybe not liking it, maybe noticing the test, but he will take it in. And Matthew is dropping in hints of Gentiles being bona fide people um, in the family of God. And why this is very significant is because the Jews in themselves had a very um, bad attitude towards the Gentiles. Let me put it that way. That by the time the story is here, um, one, these Gentiles are the people who have been oppressing them and are oppressing them at this point. Um, and also these Gentiles, just their ways are just um, abhorrent to the ways of the living God. And so there's this air of animosity, of hatred, of contempt, of disdain. And that's why we read, like for example, in the story of John chapter 4, when Jesus is meeting the Samaritan woman, and Jesus says, give me a drink. And then the Samaritan woman says, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. So Samaritans were even not even fully Gentile, they were half Jew, half Gentile. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, why would you ask me for a drink? And then it goes on to say in brackets, for Jews did not have anything in common with Gentiles. And what that means, it's not that they didn't have like hobbies and interests and anything like they were common in. It was that if the Samaritan used a cup, 
the Jew can never use that cup. Otherwise, he would consider himself unclean. If the Samaritan is in this home, the Jew cannot be in this home. And so that's the um, time where this message is coming in. And to these Jews that really don't like or hate or have contempt or animosity or wouldn't want to be around them, it is through these people that they are being told that Gentiles are a part of this story and you need to get used to it. It's very interesting how deep it goes. And so you'd think even after the resurrection, it's going to be different. People are spirit-filled. And so they know how to, they understand that Gentiles are supposed to be part of the story. Um, but I want to read to us a story in Acts chapter 10, verse 9. It's a very interesting story. You can turn with me there. Acts chapter 10, verse 9. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Sorry, backstory. So the chapter begins with a Roman centurion. We are, we are told he's a good guy. He prays, he gives alms. An angel appears to the Roman centurion and says, today you will receive a word from the Lord. And so the Roman centurion sends servants to Peter's house. So it's these servants who are coming to Peter's house to get Peter so that Peter can go to the Roman centurion and deliver God's word. And so about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. Um, and then while Peter was wondering the meaning of this vision, um, the men sent by Cornelius got to the house and they knocked the door. And so you can even see for Peter, at this point, leader of the church, um, does miracles, does all those things, preached 3,000 people and they got saved. Even for him, he needs to be softened kidogo. And so he gets into a trance, God gives a vision, three times he reiterates, basically saying, it's okay, I want you to go to this Gentile house and I want you to preach the gospel to them. And even as he's talking to them at some point, he actually says in verse 27, um, while talking to him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people and he said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anything, I should not call anyone impure or unclean. And this is a message that Matthew is trying to pass to us, that all, when, when, when we say that Jesus has come for all people everywhere, Jesus has come for all people, all kinds of people. Um, and probably we know where this message is going, to tell everyone, come as you are. Um, we've heard it a couple of times, just come. But maybe before we get there, let's also have an in-house conversation, Kidogo, as people of the family of God, as the people who would most accurately represent the Jews in this story. Um, I guess the biggest question first is to us, and the question is, what's our attitude to unbelievers, to the rejected in society, to the people who we think they are less because of their behaviors and their actions? What's our attitude to them? We see what the attitude of the Jewish people was and how it needed to be overcome. What's our attitude? And our actions show what our attitudes are. So how often do we take time to even just think about unbelievers? I know we have unbelievers in our different spaces, um, in our schools, if we go to school, in our workspaces, if we go to workplaces. 
in the places that we usually go to eat, we hear someone talks and we can tell, eh. Do we think about them? Do we choose to pray with them and pray for them, even in secret? Do we intentionally decide to reach out to different people and tell them about it? Because it shows we also probably have an attitude, and this is very individual. It's a matter of self-assessment. Is it indifference? You never think about it. You know that the Bible says that unbelievers will be destroyed, but is it indifference? Is it apathy? That you know that's their fate, but you really don't care. For whatever reason, they might as well. Is it contempt? And sometimes it's valid, especially if you're a victim of a certain um, sin or injustice. But what's our attitude, and should it not change? Should we not realize what Matthew is trying to do and realize that it should happen to us as well? That today as we go out, it must be different how we interact with unbelievers. They must be a part of our thoughts, a part of our plans to realize that God came for them. That even if you feel hatred or contempt because you are a victim of a certain sin, it would make sense why you would hate whenever you hear the word thief because at some point in your lifetime, someone came into your house and swept everything away. But the reason they are like that is because they haven't met Jesus. And the Jesus that has saved you is the same Jesus that can save them as well. And that right there is a solution, even for their own heart and turmoil and confusion that you go through because of these different type of people. And so it's up to us. God is giving us the mandate, the responsibility, we who know God, not to turn a blind eye to them, not to give them, a hand, uh, give them the hand, but to draw them into the, into the people of God, to be the people who minister to them. That Matthew is telling us his story, and we know where he ends in Matthew 28, and it says, Therefore I tell you, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore go, as you are going about your work, as you are going about your living, go and make disciples of all nations, of all people groups, all types of people. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe what I have taught you. That that's what God is calling us to do. And now to speak to the people who are amongst us or watching us um, and realize that they are not, that these people who have always been sidelined. We've told our tales of being sidelined you know how it feels, so you know probably how they feel. That there is a solution for them somewhere, um, but they're not readily welcome. Um, I remember, um, I, I bet everyone has these tales of discrimination, where Mondays are the days where we are given to rest. A habit I've been... Um, Something I've been doing in the past couple of weeks is getting out and like house hunting. So it's like, like, is it like window shopping for houses. So like I'm just going around and I'm just inquiring, oh, is he Nyumbanza Pesangapi? Let me just go in Nini Nini. And that time, so Monday I'm very casual. I know I'm very casual, but Monday I'm very casual. <laughs> so I'm probably like in Crocs and shorts and a t-shirt, so I'm just walking around, I'm looking at houses. So I probably passed by somewhere, and I, I remember once we asked somewhere, um, oh, mkona, kuna nyumba hapa, tumekuja kuona. And the person just wasn't willing to like engage with us. And so he was saying, eh, hey, 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 kuna, kuna, at least I'm hivi, kuna two bedroom, but he's in the bed sitter. And we all have this story. I think I'll need to talk to Madam Lawyer, and they need to give a public apology. I see what he did. Uh, but we all have these stories, um, stories where we are discriminated against. Even before we get into a certain space, we've been made unworthy to feel that way. And for the people who um, are on the outcast of society, you probably feel that way. That I know of people who 
even the basics, that they feel like they can't come into the house of God because of how their hair is, or they have decided to do something weird with their body, like pierce their ears or their nose or whatever. And this message is for you, that you can come and be in the family of God. That whatever you've done, that when you look through this story and you see all these people and you just wonder, how did these people make it? And the thing is, God is inviting all people. It doesn't matter what you've done. How many people you've killed? How many people you've slept with? Um... I'm trying to be PG as well. It doesn't matter what you've done. Um, if you've taken someone's um, wife or husband, if you have aborted, that all these things somehow make us think that we shouldn't be here, but God is inviting us back and telling us that we should be here. That think about the person who's telling this story is Matthew. He was known as a tax collector. And if there was someone who was the total outcast, it must be Matthew. Because he decided to align with the Roman government. So, but he's not really Roman, so he doesn't really have friends there. He's there for work. But all the Jews hate him. Because he's a traitor and he's the one. The exorbitant taxes that are being asked of them by the Romans that they even have to sell their land, and now they rent their own land that was given to them by their parents. This Matthew was hated by all people, but it is Matthew that Jesus walked by a tax booth, saw him and said, come. And of all the disciples, we can argue who was the most undeserving, but it was definite. In my opinion, it was Matthew. Or rather, everyone around him would wonder, I see why you called Peter. I see why you called Andrew. I don't get why Matthew is here. He has betrayed our whole community. And so it doesn't really matter what you've done, where you've been, that God is very particular. That when he says all people can be in the family of God, that this is where we learn how to live as God would wish that you are welcome. And so I'd like us to take some time to pray. Of everything I have spoken about, you probably lie somewhere. Some of us, we need to just check ourselves on our attitude towards unbelievers. Is it apathy? Is it indifference? And does, not, does that need to change? And does that need to change? And it changes towards compassion that he realizes are broken people that need God. And it moves to courage as well, that we go out to these people and we reach out to them. And if you're also here and you don't know Jesus, you're not a believer, and probably the only thing that held you back is you thought you're not worth it, no one here is worth it. No one here is worthy. No one here has earned a place. No one here deserves to be here. We are all here by the grace of God. So I'll invite Jeremy to just join me as we sing a song. I pray that we reflect, decide what am I going to do different? Who am I going to pray for? Who am I going to reach out to? These people need to be in the family of God. These people need, if their lives are going to change, these people need to know God, whoever they are. I'm nothing without you. Without you. You are the air that I breathe. I can't live.
just the king of the Jews, but he is the king of the universe. That when he rose from the dead, it proved that really the whole world belongs to you. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us. Forever, for wherever we are, oh Lord, may we go a notch higher with regard to our desire and our willingness and our courage to go to unbelievers and point them to you. Oh Lord, may you remove any hints of contempt, of indifference, of apathy, and oh Lord, may you clothe us with courage and compassion that we may reach out to the lost that we may realize that Christmas already opens up that door for conversation, that it's already a conversation starter, that we can go to people and easily just bring up your name, the name that is above every other name. And, oh, Lord, I do pray for those who probably they're even believers, but they've always felt like outsiders. And so they've never even wanted to do much in the house of God because they think they don't belong. Oh Lord, I pray that you may remind them that the people in Jesus' genealogy aren't all that. I pray that you may remind them that it is because of these irregularities and sins and inconsistencies and tendencies to wickedness that you came. Oh Lord, I pray for that person who knows not Jesus. Oh Lord, I pray that you may draw him to draw him to yourself. That the main reason why you came is that all people may be saved, including that single person. We trust you, O oh God. We put our lives in, our, in your hands that you may do with them as you please. This is our prayer, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.